I've never had to build a piece of machinery before, so this project is definitely going to be a challenge for me. Today I'm going to build my very own rotocasting machine out of these various components, as well as some steel that I found in our leftover steel rack. First up, I have this length of number 35 bicycle chain, as well as the connection links. Next, I have 8 of these 5 8 inch bore flange mounted pillow block bearings. I also have two of these 5 8 inch bore solid base pillow block bearings. This component is a bearing mounted tensioner gear that matches the number 35 chain. These are two 36 tooth gears that have a half inch bore and they also match the number 35 chain. Next up are a matching pair of 45 degree tapered bevel gears with a 5 8 inch bore. Next I have two bearings that also have a 5 8 inch bore. This is a half inch bore coupler that has a keyway and four set screws. Next I have 10 5 8 inch bore collars with set screws. Lastly I have a 60 RPM variable speed motor that runs on the standard American power of 110 to 120 volts. This little guy is a reduced gear motor, which means it has quite a bit of torque to it and I'll definitely need that torque to make my rotocaster run smoothly. With all of these different components, I'll hopefully be able to build myself my own rotocasting machine. For this project, I'll be using 1.5 inch square tubing to make the inner and outer rings as well as part of the stand. I cut these tubes so that the inside dimension of the inner ring will be 36 inches by 36 inches. The tubes for the outer ring were cut so that it would have inside dimensions of 43 inches by 43 inches. This will make it big enough for the inner ring and the components to fit comfortably inside the outer ring. A quick cleanup and they'll be ready to go. When cutting the tubes for the stand, I made sure that the rings would be held high enough away from the ground that everything would be able to spin freely without hitting anything. Now it's time to get everything cleaned up and ready for welding. This machine is basically a self-contained sandblaster. However, instead of sand, it uses tiny metal BBs and instead of a person using a wand, a large round platform spins everything to clean it from all angles. With all those pieces clean, it's time to cut and clean a very large piece of angle iron that I found out in our yard. I used our plasma cutter to cut an 8 foot piece in half to give me two 4 foot sections. These will be used for the main part of the stand. First up is the inner ring. I start by drilling holes in the middle of two of the tubes. These holes will be sealed with short pieces of round tube. This will keep any moisture and debris from getting in the inside part of the tubes once it's all welded together. Now it's time to start welding up the tubes for the inner ring. Years ago, I used these corner clamps to make parts of my homemade roller coaster. They used to belong to my dad and they're probably more than 40 or 50 years old. I haven't seen or used them in about a decade since the last time that I used them. When I went to go look for them, I was a bit surprised to find that they were still in the same place that I had last seen them all those years ago. They're a bit rough, some of them are missing some pieces, but they'll definitely get the job done for this project. I spent quite a bit of time and a lot of care into making sure that these corners were square and that the measurements for each dimension were spot on. I ended up cutting these tubes a little bit short for what I needed. That's why there are gaps between the tubes in the corners. Since my corner clamps were a bit damaged, they needed a little bit of extra help with holding the tubes in the correct position.
With most of the welds done, it's time to remove the clamps, flip it over, and finish welding up the last few welds. Now that I have the inner ring assembled, it's time to weld in the two short pieces of round tube and then grind everything down flush. For this step, I always use two different grinding discs, one to remove material quickly and the other one that smooths everything out. With the short tubes welded in and cleaned up, I can now add two of the collars with the set screws to each side of the hole. I do this by using the metal bar to line everything up properly. The two tubes that are across from one another with the holes each get collars with the set screws. Now I repeat the process for this side. To make sure that the set screws on the collars are lined up, I measure and make marks to line everything up with. To finish up this part of the machine, I just need to go over the whole thing with my angle grinder and clean up all of my welds. And with that, the inner ring is fully assembled and ready to be powder coated. Next, I'm going to build the outer ring. This piece is going to be much more complex than the inner ring was. This is because the majority of the mechanism that makes the thing work the way that it does is attached to the outside of this ring. Like the inner ring, I drill one hole in the middle of two of the tubes, and the other two tubes get three holes. Those three holes will match up with the flange mounted pillow block bearings. The reason for this is because one rotational axis needs to be fixed to the outer ring so that it gets rotated by the motor. The set of three holes needs to transfer rotational power through the outer ring and turn the inner ring on an axis that is perpendicular to the rotation of the outer ring. Well, that was a sentence. If what I just said doesn't make any sense, the reveal at the end of the video might help clear things up a bit. When drilling all of the holes in these tubes, I make sure to check my measurements multiple times so that everything ends up in the right place. Some corners took a little bit more to get them to line up than others did. This is likely because of the poor condition of my corner clamps. I'll have to get them restored someday. When I flipped this thing over to work on the other side, I barely had room for it to fit on my work table. I ended up cutting these tubes more to the exact size that I needed. That's why there weren't as big of gaps between the tubes in the corners. Like with the inner ring, it's time for me to weld all the short tubes in place and to grind them down flush with the surface of the square tube. For the square tubes with the three holes, I used round tubes with different inner diameters. The center tube has an inner diameter of 5 eighths, and the two outside tubes have an inner diameter of 1 half. This is because the axle in the center is a 5 eighths bar, and the bolts used to attach the bearings are only 3 eighths. The 1 half inch bolt holes give me a little bit of wiggle room for adjustments.
With all of the short round tubes welded into place, it's time again to clean up all of the welds and grind everything down nice and smooth. I don't really bring this up that often, but whenever I'm in my shop using power tools like this, I always wear ear and eye protection. With all of those welds cleaned up, just like on the inner ring, I need to weld on collars to the sides with a single hole in it. After welding on the collars, I run a 5 8 inch drill bit through it to make sure that there isn't anything there that shouldn't be there. With both sets of collars welded in place, I go over all of my welds with the angle grinder and smooth everything out. When cleaning up the welds around the collars, I have to be careful that I don't accidentally damage the set screws. When I was welding the collars in place, I didn't weld the bit just underneath the set screw. This is because I didn't want to run the risk of having the heat from the welding unintentionally warp the threads for the set screw. So I made a bit of a goof when I was initially drilling the holes in the square tubes. I forgot to add a few extra holes in one tube so I can bolt on some counterweights to this side. The other side will have several components on it which would make it heavier on that side. This will balance that out. There is a secondary reason why I use the round tubes with the smaller inner diameter for the bolt holes. That's because the thicker material would be stronger against the pressure from the tightened bolts. I actually had to weld in all of these round tubes twice. For whatever reason, when I would grind them down smooth, there would be a gap all the way around. So I'd have to weld it in a second time and then grind off the additional welding. I didn't include that in the video because it was just more work and this video is long enough as is. Wow. My grinding disc actually had a huge chunk break off for some reason. I'm really glad that it didn't hit me. I also ended up forgetting to drill a hole for the tension gear attachment, and that's what I'm working on right now. With the tube in place, I added this little piece of flat bar that is the same thickness as the bolt that will be used. This will keep the tension gear from rotating out of position. With the main construction of the outer ring done, it's time for me to work on the extra bits that will make the machine do its magic. These two 6 inch pieces of square tube will hold the bar with the gears on them that will transfer the rotational energy to the inner ring. Each tube will have a flange mounted pillow block bearing mounted on each side for a total of 4. So I need to weld in the 3 round tubes in the same pattern that I did on the outer ring. When drilling the holes in the center of these two tubes, I had to make sure that they matched one another precisely. If I had been sloppy in my measurements, the bar that runs through them wouldn't be able to rotate freely.
these parts were actually a bit difficult to work with when I was welding in the little round tubes. If I wasn't careful, even with my welding gloves on, I could easily burn my hands when trying to flip them over. Also, since they're so small, I had to get a bit creative when connecting the ground to my welder. Another quick cleanup of all of these welds and they'll be ready to attach to the outside of the outer ring. Before welding them on, I weighed them so that I can calculate how heavy to make the counterweight that will go on the opposite side of where these will be attached. To make sure that they were welded on correctly, I ran the bar through them so that I had everything lined up perfectly. It would be a real bummer to get all the way through powder coating only to find out that I had made a huge oversight. I'm sorry that this video has so much riveting footage of me cleaning up welds with my angle grinders, but I think I did an alright job of turning over 24 hours of recorded video into a 35 minute video. Finally, the inner and outer rings are finished and ready for powder coat. I think that I picked some really good personalized colors for this thing. The gray color is just a primer. After it's briefly baked for a few minutes, the color is put on. Next, I'm going to start welding up the two halves of the stand. These pieces of angle iron are heavy, so it makes them a little difficult to work with. I marked out the middle of the angle iron and tacked the tube into place. After I made sure that everything was still square, I welded the rest of it together. Since the rotating rings could put some real torque on the base here, I added some extra supports to make sure that nothing would get damaged while it's in use. The tubing that I use for this project is a bit thicker than what I usually use for projects. I usually use tubing that's about 1 16th inch thick. This tubing is 1 8th inch thick. I didn't want to go through the hassle of building this whole thing, only to have it accidentally get damaged. With the first half of the stand pretty much ready to go, I repeat everything again and build a second piece that should be identical to the first. The inside corner of the angle iron has a bit of a curve to it, which got in the way when I was welding on the tubes. I could have either ground off part of the tube to make it match the curve, or I could just fill the gap with welding material. I chose the latter. For this project, I really only spent money on the components that were shown at the beginning of the video. All of this steel was stuff that I already had sitting around in our spare steel rack. With the two halves of the stand done, I'll start working on the two pieces of 6 inch tubing that will go on the top of each half. Both pieces will have round tubes welded into them so that the solid base pillow block bearings can be bolted to them. One side will have an additional tube welded into it so that a bolt can be used to keep a gear from turning. That sentence will also make sense later. These tubes only need the two holes for the bolts. That's because the solid base pillow block bearings only attach to the top and not to the side like the other ones do.
Just like the other 6 inch tubes, these guys were a bit tricky to work with, but I got it done alright. As I did on everything else, I clean up all of the welds make it look nice and pretty. Since this one didn't exactly have a flat side, I ended up clamping it to my work table to keep it from flying away as I cleaned the welds. Next, I just need to weld some caps on each end of the tube so they'll be ready to weld onto the main part of the stand. A bit more of cleaning the welds and they'll be ready to go. I start by tacking them into place, and then once everything looks good, I finish the welds. Another thing that I forgot to do was drill two holes in this tube and weld in the small round tubes. These two holes are for the attachment points for the motor mount. Having to move these things around on my cluttered workbench just was not easy. Hey, it's everyone's favorite part of the video, me cleaning welds with an angle grinder. To make the angle iron base a little less perilous to work around, I cut a 45 degree chunk off of each corner. With those chunks cut off, I could smooth everything out with the angle grinder. Next I'm going to cut three tubes for the crossbars, and then take everything back over to the sandblaster and clean all the rust off. I know that I already showed both rings as having been powder coated, but I'd actually put them back through the machine one last time before that. To assemble the two halves of the stand together, I first need to grind down these welds so that they're nice and smooth. Now it's finally time to weld the two halves of the stand together. In all honesty, this probably wasn't the best way for me to do this. I ended up having to do a lot of fussing to get everything to line up properly, and even then, I still ended up welding things together a little bit crooked. Fortunately, I was able to adjust for this in the final assembly, and everything ended up working out just fine. For anyone who is wondering, I didn't really have enough room in my little shipping container shop to assemble this thing and still have room to comfortably walk around it, so that's why I'm out here in the big boy shop for this final assembly. There were quite a few little angles on this part, and I had to make sure that I welded them all up. Thank you. 
I uh, forgot to readjust my camera. Sorry about that. Lastly, I just need to weld on some caps to the open ends of these tubes and grind off any extra. Now it's time for the powder coat. Just like before, I have a primer layer lightly baked on, and I think I picked a color that will definitely complement the color of the two rings. I bet you thought the video was over. Nope. There are a bunch more parts left to make. Basically, I had to build the types of gears that I needed from different components. I needed two matching gears that had different attachment points in the center of them. The first gear needed set screws so that it could be keyed to a metal bar. This is me checking to make sure that the gear doesn't spin with a wobble. Everything checked out, so I'm good to weld the collars to the gear. The second gear needed to be able to stay fixed to the frame and the center could spin freely on bearings through the middle. I marked where to drill the second hole by putting a marker through the hole in the stand. Next, I used this metal tube to make a way to set the bearings into the gear. I actually ended up having to relearn how to use my dad's old lathe to make the edges of these parts flat. The bearings wouldn't work properly if these parts didn't have a flat edge on them and they were welded on at an angle. Before I can weld these on, I need to make sure that all of the rust is removed from inside and out. To weld these pieces onto the gear in the right spot, I had to assemble everything together with the bar running through it. Then I tacked the tube to the gear and removed the bearings before I did the final welds. This way I won't accidentally melt or warp the shape of the bearing. After I had the two pieces in place, I made the hole in the gear bigger so that it would rest on the bearings and not the gear itself. After a bit of welding, some cleanup, and some paint, I can finally use some epoxy glue to glue these bearings into place. Next, I had to widen one end of the collar to fit the 5 8 inch bar. The motor is one half inch, and I needed to bridge the connection between one size to the other. Then I drilled some keys into the bar for the set screws to connect with. I'm going to say this right now, it's really not easy to drill into curved surfaces like this. Especially on my drill press, and not on a proper mill. Next up, I'm going to rapid fire be making a bunch of the remaining components. Basically, all of the last bits and bobs that finish up this project. I'll try to jump in where I can and explain what I'm making. These bars need various different ways to register with the set screws that are built into the inner and outer rings. Next, and with much difficulty, I cut the chain to the length that I'll need. At the time of making this project, I was unaware that there were tools specifically for this, so c'est la vie. Next, I'm going to use this piece of flat bar to make the tension gear attachment. First, I'll drill out two holes, and then I'll use my Dremel to cut out the steel between them. The third hole is where the gear attaches. And lastly, I'm going to weld these custom cut pieces to make the motor mount. 
first off, all of these pieces have sharp edges, so I'm going to smooth those out so I don't cut myself while working with them. Then I'll use the controller to mark out where to drill the holes on this piece. After that, I'll hurt my hands on the drill press. Then I'll take out my aggression for hurting my hand by smoothing out the sharp edges. And finally, while using some clever thinking on my part, a bunch of clamps and a magnet, I'll weld these parts into a motor mount. When designing this motor mount, I took into account the adjustments that I'd need to make to get the motor to line up properly with the rest of the machine. So, when assembled, there's actually quite a bit of adjustment that I can make up and down, side to side, and forward and back. After getting a few lovely coats of powder coat, it'll be on to the home stretch of this project, the assembly! Alrighty, now that I have all of my parts made, it's time to spend the next three hours of this video showing how I put this thing together. First, I bolted the two solid base pillow block bearings onto the tops of the stand. With the bearings bolted down, I moved on to installing the outer ring first and getting the bearings lined up with the bars sticking out of either side of the ring. After that, I gave up on writing a narration because it started fading like a rock. Ha, gotcha. Well, there it is. I really like the colors that I picked out. This is actually legit the first time I tried this thing to see if it would even work. And holy crap, it actually works. Although, I turned the motor up a little too high and it made a weird noise. I don't think it likes the 60 RPM, I think that's a bit too fast for it. Oh, a uh, little something that I forgot to mention is that I added up all the weights of the different components that got added to the one side of the outer ring. Then I weighed a one inch piece of flat bar that I was going to use, and I was able to calculate how much material that I would have to add to the opposite side to balance things out. It ended up being about six pieces that were a bit longer than about a foot long. Here they are attached to the machine. It turns out that the 45 degree gears at the top had a bit too much play in them, and the fast speed made them slip a bit. It turns out that my little motor was a bit underpowered for this use. Fortunately, I bought a backup that has a gearbox that will make it about five times more powerful. Also fortunately, I was able to get a stronger motor that I could just switch out without having to rebuild the motor mount. Alrighty, let's see how this goes. Well, it absolutely has more power to make it turn, but it doesn't go nearly as fast. Which I don't think it would have helped it much. I think the slower speed is actually much better. Oh yeah, I forgot that I made one more accessory. I made these brackets that fit inside the inner ring. When using this thing to make castings from one of my molds, I'll need something inside this thing to actually hold onto the mold. And that's where these come in. They're so fancy that I even drilled some holes and tapped them with threads for the knob. Aw, just look how happy that guy is with his colorful machine. Well, with that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.